Thank you uh, very much. So it's uh, a great pleasure to be in uh, Trieste again. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to be here and for the invitation to speak. And so I, I want to talk about something which is very uh, easy. Um, it's about uh, some properties related to a fairly straightforward measure on a very, very simple space. Um, but in fact, the, the measure is, is the so-called Kazorka measure. And so the hardest thing about proving results is actually knowing what it is. And so I will give a definition uh, in a few slides, but I want to kind of creep up on it. Um, just by way of audience participation, does uh, anybody recognize uh, where the location is of this uh, picture? Excellent. <laughs> uh, it is, of course, in Trieste. It's near the canal. And the, and, uh, the person with the, the, the worst pallor is me, but the other person is uh, James Joyce, or at least a statue of him. I assume that he's uh, probably buried somewhere. Uh, okay, so I want to talk about um, uh, the Kazorka measure. And in fact, when I define it, I'll actually define it on uh, a subshift of finite type. In fact, a full shift on three symbols. Uh, but its origins actually come uh, from uh, fractals. And so in particular, for, I, I want to just creep up on it by talking a little about uh, fractals, and in particular, the Sierpinski triangle, mainly because it has nice pictures. Um, no other particular uh, reason. And to define the measures, as I said, it's easier to code the uh, Sierpinski triangle using sequences and then define the measure in that context. So the game is I'm going to talk about this measure. Its origins are as a measure sitting on the Sierpinski triangle in the plane, but I'm going to view it in terms of uh, a, a space of, uh, as a measure sitting on a space of sequences, just infinite sequences of one, twos, and threes. Kind of easy. Um, the problem is that usually if you look at measures on sequence spaces, you like them to have nice properties. You might want them to be Gibbs or equilibrium states or something like that. And it's usually, usually easier to prove things in that particular context. But this measure, when I get around to defining it, is not a Gibbs measure of that type. It's an invariant measure for the shift, but it's not a uh, Gibbs measure as we know it. And so this leads to some complications if you want to prove stuff about it. But if you are more of an optimist, uh, then you could say it's an interesting class of measures to which previous techniques don't apply, and so consequently it's interesting to study for that viewpoint. And also if you prove stuff about this measure, it's supposed to have some applications to the original context where the Kazorka measure was introduced in the context of uh, measures on, on Sierpinski triangles. And the good news is that although this measure is not Gibbs, and in particular we can't apply the usual techniques, we can move stuff around, we can modify the ideas, and there's analogous things that we can prove, uh, and indeed we can establish the sort of things you'd, you'd expect to be true for a Gibbs measure in a hyperbolic system. Just we can't follow the traditional pattern, we have to do something a bit different. But that's okay, I guess. So that's what I just said. So here's some context for no particular reason. Uh, so in the first talk of this conference, uh, Keith Burns uh, was talking about measures on, uh, for, for, for geodesic flows. And in his case, the geodesic flow had the property that it was not sort of uniformly hyperbolic, but the measures were quite nice because they were from a particular nice potential, a holder potential. And in fact, this also appeared uh, in the talk of uh, Lima on Tuesday, where he was also talking about non-hyperbolic systems, flows in that case, uh, and uh, nice regular potentials giving you the measures. And so I'm doing the opposite in some sense. I'm going to look at a nice dynamical system, but the potential which defines the measure will not be so nice. So the measures, so I'll be looking at the simplest possible hyperbolic system subshift of finite type, in fact a full shift on three symbols and for this very simple uh, dynamical system which is as hyperbolic as you could want it's, we'll be looking at a measure which is associated to a non-holder potential, a non-holder in a very bad way, it's not even continuous in any reasonable sense. Okay, so that's, that's the game, so instead of looking at uh, more general systems but regular 
potentials. We're going to look at reasonable systems, very nice systems, but with less familiar uh, potentials, because that's the way it comes. And as I said, these measures originally appeared in the context of fractals, in particular things like the Sierpinski triangle, gaskets, things like that. So let me just uh, whittle away some time by saying some words about that. So the usual construction of uh, the Sierpinski triangle is you just take a triangle in the plane, and then you simply remove the middle triangle. So that's the picture there. And then you remove the, the middle triangle of each of these pieces, and you keep on going. And so it's just a two-dimensional uh, analog uh, of the, um, the usual construction of the middle third cantor set, for example. But we're in two dimensions where you're taking out triangles rather than the middle third cantor set where you take out intervals. And um, so that's the construction. And at the end, you get some fractally-looking picture, which looks like that. And you can do stuff with it. Compute its housed or dimension, which is easy, of course. Um, and other stuff. So this is just a traditional construction. So Sierpinski is, is now mainly associated with the triangle, but in fact, he was a very distinguished uh, number theorist, and which is sometimes now forgotten, but particularly by people who do fractal things. And so here's a picture of the uh, great man, uh, which I just mentioned in passing. Uh, but I won't be looking so much at the Sierpinski triangle because to define measures on dynamical systems it's usually sometimes easier to actually look at sequence spaces. So we can code the, the Sierpinski uh, triangle just by sequences one, two, and three. And these just correspond to the three triangles that are left after we take out the, the previous one. So at the top, we take the big triangle, and then there's three pieces here, and there's three pieces here, and that's what's going to give us the coding. So the usual uh, coding is... Uh, given in a certain way. So I look at the space of all sequences of ones, twos, and threes, and I can turn it into a metric space any way I feel like doing it, but in particular, I can define a metric, which may or may not look something a bit like that. So basically, uh, sequences are close if they agree for a long time uh, in the first few uh, digits, and this is a very simple uh, metric to define on the space. And then we can associate to every infinite sequence a point in the uh, Sierpinski uh, triangle just by the coding of it, which basically means that hopefully you take an infinite sequence and you write down some expansion like this where you take the right vectors. These may be the right vectors. These are my guesses at what the right vectors are. And it's pretty much the same as if you take the middle third cantor set. There you just have two branches, so you take a dyadic expansion of points in the unit interval and you just skip anything that had a, a one in the expansion. You just take zeros and, and uh, sorry, yeah, zeros and twos in that case. Here I'm just taking this and I'm expanding points in this way. So every infinite sequence in here corresponds to a point in the triangle and most points in the triangle uh, correspond to some sequence upstairs. There could be some lack of bijection, but it doesn't matter so much in what happens. And of course, there's also some dynamics which is more apparent or more familiar for the shift uh, than it is for the, the Sierpinski uh, triangle. And the dynamics is just the usual left shift map. You just take an infinite sequence uh, indexed here from zero to infinity and throw away the first term, shift everything to the left, and it's the usual uh, shift map. And if you were to write it down in terms of the coding of the Sierpinski uh, triangle, it would just mean that you blow up each of the uh, smaller triangles by a factor of uh, two until they overlap. Okay. But basically, we're just interested in this familiar object, space of sequences, and the uh, shift map. Very easy to, to deal with. Okay. And so if you want to define the uh, Kazorka measure, it's an example of an invariant measure on the space of sequences for the uh, shift map. And usually the easiest way to define a measure uh, on spaces of sequences is to define what the measure is of the cylinder set. So just a subset of uh, the um, space of sequences. So it has a nice topology coming from the metric. You look at the Borel sigma algebra, and within the Borel sigma algebra, you have these open sets, which are simply the cylinder set indexed by a bunch of numbers. And the way that they are defined is it's all the sequences which happen to take these values 
for the first n places. So it's a standard definition of a cylinder. It's simply the guys which have the property, but they look like x0 up to xn minus 1 in the first n places. After that, you can do what you like, and that's what gives you the, the uh, cylinder set. It's a whole set. And these things are enough to, to uh, generate the, uh, it's a sub-basis of the topology, so they generate everything. And consequently, if we know what the measure of these guys are, it, it, it defines the measure of, uh, on the entire space. Basic, basic stuff. And so in particular, if it's invariant, it means that if we shift backwards and we look at the set we get, we want its measure to be the same as the first set. So hopefully it's the same as this condition. So it's a shift, it, we're interested in shift invariant measures, which we can define just by saying what all these sets look like, these cylinder sets. Okay. And so the most obvious example, I like to do obvious examples. It always gives me more confidence when I get onto more complicated stuff. So the obvious example is you take some Bernoulli measure. You can take the one-third, one-third, or one-third Bernoulli measure. So in that case, uh, the measure of each of these cylinders is just 1 over 3 to the length of the cylinder. And this gives you a measure which is well-defined, it's invariant, and somehow it looks like the natural measure to, to look at on... on at least on the Sierpinski triangle when you code it down, but it's the easiest measure you can think of on the space of uh, sequences. And you can generalize this definition and you can look at Gibbs measures. And so um, by a Gibbs measure, I mean that you take uh, the measure, you see, you have a measure mu and it's going to be a Gibbs measure. If, it, if you have the property that if you look at the measure of one of these cylinders and you look at the measure of a shifted cylinder, so this uh, is one way around or the other. Um, then you take the limit as n tends to infinity, and if it exists for every sequence x, x is one of these uh, infinite sequences, um, x0, xn, off to infinity. So if this limit exists for every point x in the space and it's holder continuous, then you say that this measure is a Gibbs measure. So it's a general class of kind of useful measures to look at on a uh, subshift of finite type. And if you take um, the obvious example, it's an example of a Gibbs measure simply because when we look at the previous definition and apply it to this measure, well, the measure of this cylinder would just be 1 over 3 to the power uh, n plus 1, I guess, and the one on the bottom would be 1 over 3 to the power n and you take the limit and you get that, um, you get that the measure is, uh, the ratio is going to give you a third, and then you take the log, and it's minus log of three. So this is a Gibbs measure for a constant function. It's not the most exciting of, of uh, examples. Uh, if you look at the next most obvious example, you could take a Bernoulli measure, and in the case of the Bernoulli measure, we can choose different weights for the three symbols, one, two, and three. And so I'll take the weights to be uh, simply P1, P2, and uh, P3. And so we define the measure of a cylinder, which therefore, once we know the measure of every cylinder, it uniquely defines the measure on the space of sequences. And we define it simply to be uh, a product of the corresponding weights, P whatever, P whatever, P whatever, where the whatevers are simply the terms defining the cylinder. So it's a standard uh, definition, and if you carry out this analysis uh, correctly uh, before, then the associated potential is just something which takes different values depending only on the first coordinate, and these values are something like um, log of P1, log of P2, and log of P3. So in the case that they're all the same, P1 is equal to P2 is equal to one third, then we should get the same value as above. And this defines, this explains why uh, Bernoulli measures are examples of Gibbs measures with the previous definition. It's because this is a continuous function defined on the space of sequences. It's a locally constant. It only depends on the first coordinate. And because of the way that the uh, metric was uh, defined, uh, this is going to be continuous. OK, so this is very uh, easy uh, stuff, easy-ish stuff. And as I said, I mean, generally one talks about Gibbs measures or equilibrium states. The words tend to be interchangeable nowadays, although they have a slightly different meaning, um, in the context that these potentials are holder continuous. Because then you can apply a rich theory, uh, which dates back to such people as Sinai and Ruel, 
um, uh, to prove all sorts of things. Um, but in the case of a Kazorka measure, it does not have this property. It's a measure which is defined on the space of sequences. So in particular, we, we can actually say what the measure is of each of the uh, cylinders. That's how we define it. But when we try to work out the potential, it turns out that it's not a holder continuous potential, which causes some problems. So am I going to tell you what the Kazorka measure is? Yes. So here again, I'm just saying that in order to define the measure, on the space of sequences, of uh, ones, twos, and threes, infinite sequences, I need to specify what the measure is of one of these sets, one of these cylinder sets. So for every choice of i0 up to i n minus 1, where n could be arbitrarily large, I want to say what the measure is of this particular cylinder set. And in the case of, of Gibbs measures, usually there's some function hanging around. Uh, like, like in the case of these Bernoulli measures, but in this case, it's actually defined using matrices. And so instead of giving the general definition, I'll start off by talking about the classical definition, the classical example. And the game there is that if I want to specify the measure of this particular cylinder, so each of these i zeros up to i n minus 1 is just a number between 1 and 3. It's 1, 2, or 3. So there's going to be uh, presumably 3 to the n different choices of cylinders of length uh, n. And the way I do it is I look at the indices, the things that define it. So each of these guys is an i0. Uh, each of these i0, i1, up to i n minus 1 is either 1, 2, or 3. I look at the corresponding one of these three matrices up there, and I take the products of the matrices. So in the case of Bernoulli measures, you multiply numbers together. Here I'm multiplying matrices together. And then I, I do this twice. Actually, it's the same matrices. So I look at the product matrix. I take the transpose of it. And then I sandwich in between it this extra matrix. So I'm defining the, my, my Kazorka measure on the space of sequences of ones, twos, and threes, um, the full shift on three symbols. And the way I'm defining it is by taking a product of, of um, matrices corresponding to the indices of the uh, cylinder. And the hope is that this measure should be well defined, and also that it turns out that it's shift invariant. In this case, you can just do it by some sort of computation. In the more general case, uh, which I haven't said yet, uh, it, it follows from the more general definition. But this gives rise to a measure which is a probability measure defined on the space. It's also a sigma invariant. And so if you're an ergodic theorist, you might ask the question like, is this measure uh, ergodic? And the answer is yes, it was proved uh, in 1989 by Kozorka that the measure is a godic. Uh, 1989, incidentally, was the last time I was in Trieste prior to this week. I'm not sure if that's fate or not. Uh, and I haven't actually said much about why this measure was introduced or who cares about it. Uh, well, the people that care about it most are people that study Laplacians. Uh, but these are not people who study Laplacians on Riemannian manifolds. These are people who study Laplacians on fractals. So, for example, there is a theory um, of defining a Laplace operator, a Laplacian, on, for example, the Sierpinski triangle. And the way it's constructed and the way it's defined uh, works best with a certain class of measures. And the certain class of measures are these so-called uh, Kazorka measures. So up until... Yesterday, I had three slides following this, uh, telling you uh, how the Kazorka measure appears, a bit of its history, and something about harmonic measures and functions on um, the Sierpinski triangle. But I decided it was better to shift them to the end of the talk, in the hope that I wouldn't get there, and talk more about the, the ergodic properties of this measure. So let's, for the moment, just say it's a funny measure with some connection to a different area. Uh, which is a, a godic shift invariant measure on a well-known friendly uh, dynamical system, a trivial dynamical system. And we can start asking questions uh, about it. And so if we were given this definition, the first thing we might ask, well, is this measure a Gibbs measure? That is, is there a nice function uh, psi with the property that when we look for the potential function for it, uh, does this potential function have nice properties. So if it was holder continuous, then we'd have a Gibbs measure. For, for, for the potential was holder continuous for this, for this um, Kazorka measure, then the good news is that we could just roll out uh, the classical theory 
and we could prove all sorts of things about central limit theorems, large deviation theorems, stuff like that, um, and, and it would be easy. Uh, but the bad news is that the thing isn't uh, continuous. In fact, there's a result from last year uh, which shows that, in fact, this function has uh, a dense set of discontinuities. So not only is it not holder continuous, it's not very continuous. And so this is my attempt to evoke the fact that it has a dense set of discontinuities. It's simply something I plotted in Mathematica, which conveys nothing in particular, except it's meant to look like something not very continuous. Uh, the limit exists almost everywhere, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it exists almost everywhere, the limit, but it, it's not with respect to itself, um, which is not overly helpful, really, but, you know, okay. But it doesn't have any good topological properties in the sense it's not, it's not holder, it's not continuous, it's not whatever you'd ask for after that. Um, okay, so it's, 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 a, it's a simply defined measure which has ba bad properties in terms of this potential. Okay, so therefore, um, one wants to still prove things about it, and, and one has to develop some other approach. So our, our, our first result, or maybe our main result even, uh, is that not only is it um, agodic, but of course it's also strongly mixing. And so strongly mixing simply means that if you take any two functions, f1 and f2, and you shift one function uh, by the, uh, the shift map, which is the dynamics here, multiply it by the other function, and then compare it with the, uh, the integrals of the first two functions. So this is a correlation function between um, the shift of, of the function and uh, the second function. Then this, this thing is strong mixing. So in particular, this, this quantity tends to zero. So the dynamics kind of spreads out in some nice way. And moreover, it's actually... Um, exponentially mixing in the sense that if we choose these functions to be more regular, and in this case we can choose the functions to be um, Lipschitz, say, still doesn't say anything about the potential because the measure is given to us, but when we test it with these Lipschitz functions, it transpires that it has exponential decay of correlations. A fact which, of course, is very easy to prove in the context of Gibbs measures, but it's not so easy to prove in this context. And so the rate of Decay is given by this alpha, which is a number between 0 and 1. And in this particular case, it's anything very close to 5 over 7. This is just an explicit calculation because it's a very explicit uh, measure. Okay, so it's a result. It's a result that says that not only do we have ergodicity, but we have uh, strong mixing. And in particular, it, it, we have mixing which is exponential fast. In fact, once we have strong mixing, we have things like uh, exactness and stuff like that. But uh, let me not concentrate on that. This is a, a picture of my uh, co-authors, uh, Anders Johansson and, and uh, Anders uh, Uberg. Um, this is uh, Anders Uberg. Uh, I think it's at the Uppsala train station, which is now some sort of restaurant. Uh, and the picture on the right uh, is a picture of uh, Anders Johansson, who does not have many photographs uh, that you can track down. Uh, uh, there's a picture of him explaining something very patiently to me, uh, which usually he has to do very patiently because uh, I have trouble following what he's saying. It's usually complicated, and he's a smart guy. Anyway, so this is, these are my two co-authors, and this is the uh, result. And, of course, once you can prove things like exponential mixing, the same method, or at least a direct application of the result, gives you a host of other kinds of uh, results. So let me, let me just mention um, three kind of things that one would um, want to do. And so um, once we know that the measure is agodic, then, of course, it means that you can apply the uh, burkhoff egodic theorem. And the burkhoff egodic theorem simply says that you have the dynamics, the shift map, you have the measure mu, which is this fancy uh, Kazorka measure defined in terms of these funny matrices. And then the burkhoff egodic theorem tells us that the temporal averages are the same as the spatial averages. That is, you average along an orbit, and you get the integral of the function over the space for almost all points x. It's what it always says, basically. Um, so here's a picture of Carino, who actually gave the burkhoff egodic theorem as uh, the definition of uh, ergodicity, which is even easier. Um, and 
once you have the ergodic theorem, which is, which is just a beautiful classical theorem, um, you can ask how you can improve it. And the classical improvements are you assume more about the function f. If you keep assuming the function is f1, you can prove very little more generally. Um, but if you assume that the function is more regular, maybe Lipschitz, then you could ask if you can prove things like central limit theorems, which are different kinds of averages, or large deviation results. Or if you're particularly attached to the burkhoff egodic theorem, you can ask if there's an error term in this convergence. So these are three kind of classical things you, people tend to ask, at least in a Godic theory or smooth ergodic theory, um, once you've established the ergodicity. So if you know that the measure is ergodic, can you prove these results uh, as, as well? And the answer to all three of these is yes, there are uh, analogs of these results. In the case of classical Gibbs measures, Bernoulli measures, Gibbs measures with hold of potential, these things again are very classical and easy to prove nowadays. Um, but in the context of uh, Kazulka measure, it's a bit more difficult. So here again is just a, a statement of the burkhoff egodic theorem. So we're taking the shift, a full shift on three symbols, an old friend. We're taking the Kazulka measure, a new friend, <coughs> which we know is uh, uh, egodic. So we know that this theorem applies. And then we want to prove a, uh, a central limit theorem. So central limit theorems work on the principle that somehow you want to replace the 1 over n by a 1 over square root of n, for example. So you want to look at how things uh, fluctuate where the scale is changed by, from n to 1 over n. So here is the same summation, n equals 0, n minus 1. So the summation along the first n points in the orbit for a typical point x. But instead of dividing by, uh, one over, by n, we divide by square root of n. And then we ask, well, what proportion, what measure of points has a property that this particular average is within this range, alpha to beta, of the integral. So this is what central limit theorems look like. And possibly the normal distribution looks like that. I always write this down from memory and usually get it wrong. But anyway, it should converge to the normal distribution as n tends to infinity. And indeed, in the case of the Kazorka measure, this is still true. So the central limit theorem, which you can think of as an extension of the, of the burkhoff egodic theorem in some sense, is also true in the context of um, these things. And the other theorem I mentioned, the second theorem I mentioned, was to do with uh, large deviations. And so, again, it's a variant on what happens with the burkhoff egodic theorem. So the burkhoff egodic theorem says, as, as I said, that for typical points, uh, you have the averages converge to the integral, classical result. And in the case of large deviation results, you ask, well, what proportion uh, of, of, of the uh, sequences, what proportion of the space, has a property that this difference is greater than some fixed bound from where you're going? So you know that these averages are converging to the integral of f d mu. You look at the difference of these things, and you ask, well, how long do I have to wait so that the proportion of the space for which this is bigger than epsilon is smaller than some particular value. And these large deviation results typically say that the, the measure goes down exponentially fast. So our bound here is fixed. The epsilon is fixed, bigger than 0. But the proportion of a space that haven't quite made it yet is going down at some exponential rate. So it's another kind of statistical result. Hmm? N capital, which one? That one. You are perfectly correct. It should be at capital N. So let's not go back to that. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so all the ends that should be capital N's should be capital N's. And all the ones that shouldn't be, shouldn't be. Uh, so yes, yesterday, or maybe the day before, I, I, I read through the slides, and there were endless sigmas that should have been, it was en endless t's that should have been sigma. So sometimes my transformations were t's. So there are some, it's like, it's, like, it's like when I try and speak Italian when I only speak Portuguese. You know, there's, some, there's some loss in translation between these two settings. But James Joyce certainly helps. I can't understand him in any language. Um, OK, so, so again, the, a large deviation result could be thought of as a kind of generalization, a, a, a more sophisticated version, in some sense, of the burkhoff egodic theorem. 
Uh, and it also holds in the case of the uh, Kazorka measure, and this is what the statement would say more or less. And there's also these um, uh, level two, type two, large deviation results involving measures about which I will say uh, nothing. So that's, that's two kinds of generalizations, if you like, of the, central, uh, of, of the burkhoff egodic theorem. There's the central limit theorem, there's the large deviation result, but the third thing I mentioned was error terms for um, the, um, the burkhoff egodic theorem. So yes, again, third time, maybe even the fourth time. Uh, here's a statement of the burkhoff egodic theorem. So we, we always have this result, but by ergodicity, if we average some nice function, L1 is enough in this case, along the orbit, the averages converge to the uh, integral. But you might ask, well, for typical points, can we say how fast it converges? Well, if we assume that the function is more regular, and in shift spaces, Lipschitz tends to be a good, good notion of regularity, then the answer is uh, yes. And so, in fact, you can prove uh, the following, that if your function here is Lipschitz um, on the space, so it's got some nice, nice regularity property, then, in fact, this, the difference between these two guys tends to, to zero at some rate. And in this case, I've got the n correct. It's uppercase n. So it goes something like this, which has got a, a large number of confusing logs on the top. Uh, but if you ignore those, it basically says that the thing goes to zero at least uh, as fast as uh, 1 over square root of n minus something. So it's an error term in the ergodic theorem. And of course, since it's an almost everywhere result, the O here depends on your point. So there's a constant implied in this, which of course depends on the, the x at which you're applying it. So you can write this as true for almost all points x. And in fact, the, the proof of these results, um, the proof of the last result, the error term, is extremely easy. And it's uh, an immediate consequence of uh, stuff uh, to do just with the exponential mixing. In fact, some reasonable rate of mixing and a bit of spectral theory. Uh, stuff, stuff that doesn't appear in courses so much anymore, but it's kind of straightforward to, to prove. So these are just three uh, applications of the ideas to do with exponential mixing and how it percolates through to a Godic theory and uh, a Godic averages. And because we have these results on, on exponential mixing, or at least some machinery that does that, then these three applications apply in the case of the Kazorka measure, which unfortunately is not a measure which is a, is a classical Gibbs measure, but at least has these sorts of uh, properties. Uh, so let me say something about the strategy of the proof. I always hate talking about proofs in talks. Uh, I always have this phobia that someone will suddenly point out a mistake, um, uh, but that, that hasn't happened yet. It's happened to other people in talks I've been to, but not in mine. Um, so what happens here is that we'd like to define We'd like it to be a Gibbs measure, but it isn't. But we can still define this, 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 this candidate for the potential. We just take the ratio of these guys and take the limit. It's, it's basically a Jacobian, as it used to be called in the old days. And it, it, it's not as good as we want it to be. But if it was a nice measure, then we'd know what to do. We could apply classical Ruel Perron Fabinius techniques, which sometimes are now called transfer operator techniques. And basically, we'd, we'd take the shift map. And what we do is we would just average over the pre-images with this potential, and then God would be kind to us, and this operator would have a spectral gap, and this spectral gap would imply mixing. So this is what everyone does in courses nowadays. And then just using the usual duality between the transfer operator and the shift map, uh, you get the result. So that's what we would do if it was a Gibbs measure. Uh, and the game here is that we, we can't use Lipschitz functions or Holder continuous functions on the space, but we'd like to follow the same strategy, but we'd like to introduce a different space of functions, one that works, for example. And we'd also like to prove that the corresponding operator still has a, a spectral gap, because then we will be able to do just what we did before. OK, and so what, what is the, the space uh, of functions, which, is, which I'm going to call B, I think B is meant to invoke Banach space for some reason, but that's OK. Uh, so just by way of notation, I'll let uh, A of n, uh, it's the finite sigma algebra corresponding to cylinders of length n. So basically, um, it's, it's just, um, it's just some, some, some collection of sets. 
which is nested as n gets bigger, these things get smaller. And then I want to associate the expectation operator associated to these finite sigma algebras. And the word expectation operator here sounds extremely pretentious. All it means is that it's the linear operator which takes a function uh, which is defined on this space. So it's just defined on the entire space with respect to the Borel sigma algebra. And it gives you a locally constant function. And the locally constant function is meant to be one which only depends on the first n coordinates. And how does that work? Well, you look at the first n coordinates of wherever you are, and you just average the function over that, and that's what you get. So it's just an approximation to your given function, um, which is given in this way, and classically it's just an expectation operator. Um, and the, the Banach space, well, it's going to be something like... Um, hold a continuous functions, except it's got to accommodate these discontinuities. And so the way it works is that we take some function f, and we look at these approximations to it with respect to the expectation operator, and we look at successive approximations. And so the idea is these things are getting smaller. And we ask that they get smaller at some sort of exponential uh, rate. So if I was going to say something uh, vaguely pretentious, I'd, I'd say it was something like moving from um, smooth functions to, to, to a Sobolev space where now you, you, you're, you're using integration rather than supremums or something like that. I'd use some words like that, but I won't. I'll just say that this is some way of defining a space which accommodates these rather bizarre potentials. And the potential psi, which I defined before, uh, associated to the Kazorka measure, the thing that would have been a potential if it was holder continuous, sits inside this space, which is kind of reassuring. Um, and it has some sort of norm, which is good. And it's just saying something about regularity. Uh, let me not say anything else about it. Uh, this space, of course, contains um, uh, the, the Lipschitz functions. In fact, all hold the continuous functions if you choose suitable theta. Just because it's, it's measuring how things go, get approximate in an L2 sense. And if they're Lipschitz, they actually approximate faster than that. So it, it contains Lipschitz functions. So we can apply it to, to Lipschitz functions if we want to prove stuff. And it has the property um, that um, the operator preserves the space, which is good. Otherwise, it's a bit useless introducing it. So we have our Gazorka measure. We associate this, this, this hopeful potential, which is not a holder continuous, but is relatively nice, and because it lies in this space B. The, the old familiar transfer operator, when we try to do it, the analog preserves the space. Uh, it, it has to fix the constants because that's how it's defined. And in particular, if you quotient out by the constants, then you get that the spectral radius of what's left is smaller than one, or if you like, it's got a spectral gap. So the original operator acting on, on this funny Banach space has a property, it has a maximal eigenvalue at one, if I do it that way around, at one, and then the rest of the spectrum is, is, is in some ball, which is strictly smaller, i is spectral gap. And that's exactly what you use to prove all these results. Uh, you might hope that the way to do this would be to follow a traditional path, which is to use things like the Sotter-York inequalities and things, but that doesn't work too well either. And so, in fact, the method of proof is not actually to work directly with this Banach space, but in fact, instead to look at a space of matrix-valued um, functions. And that's simply because the measures are defined using matrices, and it turns out to be easier to do it that way. But philosophically, these results are like the setting where you look at more general functions, these things defined using expectation operators, but rather than proving things directly with them, you actually have to, at the moment, to go through this more indirect uh, method. So now I can't remember what's uh, on the next slide. Uh, it says 18 out of 23. So uh, generalization. So let me, let me say the following. So I, I define the Gazorka measure using one, two, three matrices called A1, A2, and A3 and a third matrix called um, curly E. And so if there was only one such measure, perhaps it wouldn't be so exciting. Uh, but in fact, it's part of a general class of measures, which are defined by just looking at uh, matrices. And so more generally, uh, you do the following. Uh, we look at a full shift on K symbols. Before K was equal to three, now it's equal to K. And it has the property that these matrices, well, before they were two by two, now they can be d by d. 
And we also have a, a, a positive definite a D by D uh, matrix epsilon. I'm not sure the last one was positive definite, but maybe it was. And uh, this matrix, of course, is some typographical error, which should just say matrix. And given uh, these objects, you, you require this property, which is you take the matrices and the transposes, you multiply them together, and you end up with something which is identity. And if you use this epsilon and you do it the other way around with the products of matrices, you also get the identity. And there's an extra strong irreducibility condition, which is something about taking the matrices, and there shouldn't be a finite number of hyperplanes which are preserved by them, which I'll skip. And then you define the measure in exactly the same way. So using this finite collection of matrices, you cook up these new, this new, newer class of uh, measures, a funny class of measures, and it's done in exactly the same way. We define the measure of a cylinder just by looking at the indices. And for these indices, we take the products of the corresponding matrices from the list, take the transpose, multiply by the other matrix, and multiply by the matrices we first thought of, and, it, and we end up with a well-defined and shift-invariant measure. And these two conditions, one way around or the other, uh, give you the properties that it's well-defined and invariant. That's why we have to ask for these two conditions. So, no, there's no relation between the D and the K, except any, any D that works. If you can find matrices that satisfy these conditions, you're in good shape. I think you can probably find a continuous family because there's no, there's no restriction on the entries. You can wobble them a bit. And if you count the dimensions, it probably works. And, what I, and, and if you take the, the, the extremely tedious case that D is equal to 1, for example, then you can actually write Bernoulli measures like this. But that's not so difficult since there are only 1 by 1 matrices. I, I, I don't think it's necessary unless somebody points out that you need it for these conditions to hold, which I don't think you do. So as far as I know... I, I only require these conditions. Uh, okay, and so you can just cook up these things for whatever reason, and then exactly the same method of proof gives you a, a similar result, which is that we have a shift invariant measure on, in this case, a full shift on K symbols, and uh, it has the property that it's agodic, and moreover, it's, it's uh, strong mixing, which is better than agodic, and moreover, it's exponentially mixing, when you look at Lipschitz uh, functions, for example, or hold the continuous functions, it doesn't make any difference. And in this case, uh, the, the alpha is more mysterious. I, I don't know explicitly what it is in any other, well, in many other given cases. Um, the, gen the general argument doesn't give you explicitly what alpha is uh, in terms of, of the matrices, but in special cases, you can actually compute it, and that, that was what I did. And so I do know what's on the next uh, four slides. Uh, so. What I would like to do is to skip through the next three slides because I think it's time for lunch. Uh, this is the uh, original definition of a Kazorka measure. It's on the Sierfinsky casket. Ignore all these slides. Um, it's, it, you have to look at harmonic measures. You have to look at harmonic functions. Uh, keep going. And, and let me thank you for, for coming to the talk. <laughs>